Uh, so welcome everyone to our fifth discussion forum based on the Delta Think News and Views series. Uh, for those of you who've joined us before, welcome back. We're happy to see you again. And for those of you who are new, we're glad you decided to join us today. Uh, first, let me start off with a few introductions. I'm Lori Carlin, Chief Commercial Officer here at Delta Think, and I'll be introducing the session for us today. With me are my colleagues and News and Views authors, Ann Michael, founder and CEO of Delta Think, and Dan Pollock, our Chief Digital Officer at Delta Think, and along with Ann, an architect of the Delta Think OA data and analytics tool. If you've joined us for a News and Views forum before, then you know we've designed these forums to be very interactive with lots of questions and participations from, from everyone in the audience. So I really hope uh, you're ready for a lively and informal discussion and uh, ready to ask your questions. Um, a few logistical items before we begin. When you have a question, if you can ask it in the Q&A box, that would be great. Uh, in terms of structure, we'll have some opening remarks from, from Anne and then from Dan to start us off with. And then we'll move into the questions and open discussion after that. Um, just to set expectations, because this is meant to be informal and open, um, even though we've scheduled an hour for this session today, it's really up to you and the number of questions uh, that we get. So we may end earlier. Um, it all depends on how much discussion there is. So thank you again for joining us. And I will hand off to Anne now to get us started. Thanks, Lori. So, I mean, just very briefly before we get st started, um, while you may know that we do lots of different topics throughout the years in News and Views, um, two topics are always the same and always done around the same time. One of them is this survey of um, open access charges, which is usually done right around this time in March. Um, you know, we're doing it actually in January and February, but it's being discussed, uh, published in March. The other one is market sizing, which is in the fall, right around open access week. So in October, that's usually published. And in doing um, these open access charges, what we do is we do an annual refresh of the charges that we have within the database. Of course, we spot refresh as necessary throughout the year, but in January, we make sure we look at everything, um, which um, across the years that we've been doing this account for around 18,000 um, different price points uh, or um, journals. Anyway, so right now, Dan is going to start taking us through a bit of what's in the news and views. And what you will notice, this is the first for us on our webinar, we actually have um, listened to some of your requests, and we have a couple of slides for some of the more data intensive discussion topics. So Dan, do you want to get started? Absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Anne. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just kick off by giving you some headlines, and then we can get into a bit more detail about kind of the pattern and shape of things. So before I start uh, putting the, the, the graphs and charts up, the big news this year, of course, when we looked at pricing, uh, was of course that some of the very high impact titles um, had started to formally offer APCs for the first time. So I'm thinking of uh, titles like the Nature Research Journals and the Cell family of titles. Um, and I think that might make, made some, some, some quite a splash. So, what that means is when you just look at the, the kind of the extremes, as it were, the maximum and minimum, um, the minimum is always around zero. Plenty of people don't charge APCs or offer a sort of pay what you want to uh, view. That, that's remained pretty much the same over time. But what, of course, has changed is with the very high impact um, journals coming in, the maximum prices have now gone up. So last year or the last time we did the study, um, they were topping out around about $5,900. Uh, we basically normalize everything to US dollars. Um, it, it just makes it easy to compare like for like. So this year, it moved from $5,900 to uh, the, the top is now $11,390. So breaking through that $10,000 barrier, and that's from the nature research titles. The cell titles, the flagship cell is coming at $9,900. Uh, and then most of the other titles, I believe, come in around about $8,900. 
So a significant leap up from, from that 5,900 or so. Um, and those, all of those journals, those very high impact journals are of course hybrid journals. So that's, that's the headlines, that's how they sort of move the things on our charts and so forth. And what I want to do now, and I hope you've now all seen your screens update to show a, a, a chart in front of you. Very briefly, uh, if you look to the top of your Zoom window, you will probably see a view options uh, menu, little thing. If you click on that, I suggest you set it to fit in window. So view options, fit in window. That will make sure you see all of the chart uh, on one screen and not sort of looking at it through a, a tiny hole, as it were. So what we're seeing here is um, our pricing data essentially wrapped up into a histogram. So we're looking at the number of titles that's plotted vertically, and then we're, we're looking across a series of price bands listed along the horizontal axis, and the height of the bars is representing how many titles uh, have prices within each price band. Um, you'll notice they're color coded by publisher, probably a bit too much detail, um, so please just look at the overall shape of, of the plot. That's really what we're interested in here. Um, and then when we first started putting this data together a few years ago, um, we needed to figure out what the price bands would look like. Um, and we alighted on $500. We just found that gave us a nice balance between um, being detailed enough so you could see what was going on without being so detailed that it, it got a little bit overwhelming. So you, you see these sort of $500 price bands along the bottom. And then really, I think the big thing that changed this year is you notice the whole chart is skewed to the left. So there's a very thin long tail on the right hand side. And, that, and that's these few very high impact titles at, at those, those higher prices um, at the right hand edge. Um, and I think really one of the key takeaways of this is, uh, as we explored in our piece, is that the headlines of course are always interesting, we like to read about them, but it, the, the few outliers at the top of the range don't make the market. It's an actual fact the good solid average in the middle, that's really accounts for what is going on as a whole. Um, and that's really what you see in this chart here, that you know, there's the most common price is that 2,500 to $3,000 band. That's the highest bar. That's where the most titles are likely to be priced. And then you've got the next most common price band is just a little a bit higher than that, that 3,000 to 3,500 uh, US dollars for, for an APC. Um, and you know, clearly there are many, many more. There's thousands of titles sitting in those those buckets compared with just the, the dozen or so at the very high end of the market. So when we start to analyze patterns in it, of course, we're, we're interested in those very tall bars. Um, what we're seeing here is a mix both of, uh, of all the journals. So we're combining both fully open access journals uh, and hybrid journals. We could, if we wanted, split those out. Um, I'll, I'll do that in, in, in a little bit, but our, our tool that we're looking at here does allow us to, to dice and slice those. But just to keep things simple for now, um, really the, the hybrids tend to follow or make the market because the bulk of, you know, by far and away, the, the greater number of journals are hybrid. But you will see this like little secondary hump, the sort of $1,000 to $1,500 um, range. Um, and that's really speaking to the, the fully open access journals, uh, which some people refer to as gold journals. So these are the journals that only offer fully open access options. Um, and, and there the, the pricing is slightly different. The highest prices for a fully open access journal is about five and a half thousand, five, five, six, oh dollars. Um, that was up from five, four, three, five last year. So much lower and in general, fully open access journals charge lower prices than hybrid ones. Um, typically, rule of thumb, the, the average APC for a fully open access journal is around about just under 60% of the average APC for a hybrid. Um, and that just under 60% has gone up very slightly over the last few years by a few percentage points. There's a very, very slow convergence of the pricing of fully open access journals just very slowly rising to meet the price, um, price point of um, their uh, hybrid cousins. Um, and then finally, just to round off the, the, the kind of what's cheap and what's expensive slide, as I like to call this one, um, just to give you some headline averages. So for fully open access uh, journals, the average uh, APC is $1,800 and the median is $1,780. Um, so in actual fact, you know, that probably means that the prices are quite symmetrical if you plot them out on the chart. Um, the hybrids, the average price is 
$3,100, average being the mean, and then the median is around about $3,000. Um, US dollars. So I'm just going to pause there briefly just to, to let some of that um, sink in. And I don't know if you want to come in with any observations or thoughts before we move on. No, I was just uh, just uh, looking at the Q&A here. We can interject. Um, yeah. Someone asked if the data was available publicly and the data behind this. And actually, this is part of a subscription product that we've had uh, on the market since 2017 put a lot of time and effort in collecting and analyzing this data. So we're always willing to talk to folks if they have a specific need for a chart, especially for some open purpose, we'd be happy you know, to just get in touch with us. But no, a wholesale release of the data is, is not, um, not possible. Our, our subscribers get that. Um, we also do have another question. We might as well also uh, move into that too. Uh, will funders, especially Coalition S, pay that 11,390 fee for nature or balk anyway, because it's still hybrid is such an outlier. Um, it is such an outlier. Do you expect anyone to actually fund that? Um, so I'll, I'll take a shot at that, Dan, and then you can talk. So yeah, then we, we, can, we can talk it up. Um, that is a, that, that is a, it, it's a great question. Um, and so I think we also have to put it in perspective. Like uh, obviously nature is a highly selective journal. There are only a few articles that would ever probably find themselves in the position. Um, what we've seen historically, uh, you know, when it comes to higher price APCs, granted not nature, which has, um, you know, which is, is in a little different place is that oftentimes They'll, they'll split funding or a funder might pay part of it uh, or not all of it. Uh, and, and so I guess my, my intuition is, I don't really believe this would be something that is going to happen you know, excessively just because of the nature of the selectivity of, 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 of nature. But um, I do think if an article gets accepted to nature, there's a good probability someone's gonna figure out how to fund that. Um, Dan, I don't know what your opinion is. Um, well, yeah, I'd probably take it a, a bit further. Um, the only surprise for me is that this has not happened sooner. And there's a, there's a couple of reference points that I, I sort of base that conclusion on. Um, for the older viewers in our audience uh, who, who may remember back to the early noughties uh, when open access was first really beginning to, to take off at scale, um, there was a UK government inquiry into all this uh, that gathered evidence from a number of stakeholders um, and one of the headlines arising from that was that the then chief executive officer of the then Nature Publishing Group um, was one of the many people that submitted evidence to the inquiry. And he puts on record that um, unless people were prepared to pay between 10 and 30,000 pounds APC, that that would be what they'd have to pay to cover the costs of the publication in a high impact journal. Now, I actually went back to the minutes from that meeting with a published report in preparation for this, when he said costs, I don't know if he means cost of production or cost to the buyer of the content. So whether, you know, as in revenue replacement, but it was interesting that 10 to 30,000 figure sort of has stuck around. And, and if you, you know, if you follow open access over the years it occasionally crops back up again. So in that sense, I don't actually think that 11,390 bucks, which is just under 10,000 pounds, um, depending on the exchange rate, maybe well over at some point, uh, depending on how Brexit goes. But um, I, I don't think that's an outrageous number, to be honest with you. I think it's coming in quite at the low end um, of what might be seen as a very, very high value item. And notice I say might be seen as, I'm not advocating um, in favour of a particular journal, but certainly the high impact journals in general do put in a lot of labour and, and they do a lot of intensive work to, um, to produce what they do. They reject a huge amount of, of their submissions and rejections are a cost. So in that sense, and I'd probably pick up what you said and wrong with it and say, you know, I, I could actually see that, that people would be prepared to pay for that, um, for the prestige, and, and if, they, they, if they see it as being a high value item. I'm kind of laughing because Dan and I had a big, let's <laughs> call it air quotes argument about this. So it really depends. And we can get into this debate maybe when you're, yeah, after you go through, I know you have two more, um, charts to, to look at, but it gets into a debate about cost plus pricing or value pricing. And I think historically, from a publisher's perspective, 
we're looking at value pricing, but oftentimes from a librarian or a researcher's perspective, they're really looking at cost plus pricing. And so that's when you get in to the debate of picking apart what's done for a particular price. And there are many things that Nature the Journal does and it costs them money. Um, and I think Nature and many would argue it produces a value in reach, in you know exposure and all these other things. Um, you know, the question then is, is the consumer, but the one who actually gets accepted into nature are willing to pay that or not? And that's really what it yeah. comes down to. Um, Dan, why don't you keep going? We have a couple more questions, but I think you might get into some of this as you proceed. So we'll get yeah. to your questions. Um, in and, and we can certainly come back to it. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, so we've looked at a snapshot of the current year's prices in a, in a histogram that's still on your screen. Um, one of the values of, of well, we think the values of what we do is, is we, as Anne said, we try and take this snapshot at the same time every year. And that then means we can look at some meaningful trends analysis over time, because, of course, you know, th these outliers illustrate a broader point, which is how are prices changing? Are they going up? Or are they going down? Is it getting more cheaper or, or more expensive and so on? So what I want you to do is just imagine you, you draw a smooth line through the tops of each of those bars in, in, in red ink um, to, to, to get an overall shape of the plot. Um, and what we do is we, we do that and then we repeat that for each of the previous year's data. And if you do that, you will get a chart a bit like this. So um, for the data geeks amongst you, this is actually what's known as a density plot. It's just a histogram with a smooth line drawn across the top. And the red line, excuse me, represents the current year's prices. And then as you go from red through orange to green, you're going back in time. So the greener it gets, the earlier it gets, as shown in the key at the top right. Um, I mentioned briefly that we can, use, we can split the data out by fully open access and hybrid journals. And that's what we've done in this slide. And in particular, we're looking at only hybrid journals um, in analyzing our patterns. So if you look, for example, at that red line, you'll see the, the, the peak just by the, the, the arrow labeled one, just by the, the tip of the arrow labeled one, that's our most common price band. And then you'll see just to the right of that, it drops off a little bit. And that was the, the second most common price band that, that I pointed out. Um, but very much, the hybrids very much tend to sort of drive the markets and so many of them. Um, but what this sort of analysis allows us to do is then say, well, okay, how's that spread of prices working over time? And if we, if we sort of go back in time, we look at the greenest um, item, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a peak slightly to the right uh, of, of things. And what happened was that the overall shape of things shifted to the left in the chart. So in other words, the most common price point became a bit cheaper, basically dropped by about $500 on average. And that's what um, Arrow 1 is just highlighting. So a few years ago, things got a bit cheaper and then they seem to have pretty well stabilized. And what appears to be happening now is that the most uh, common price band is spreading out. It's including more journals in it. And this gets us into quite an interesting nuance of this sort of analysis that um, it's actually as much about the spread of prices and where things sit under the curve that drives the total value of the market. So, for example, what we're seeing is because there are increasing numbers of, of journals at a slightly higher price point, you multiply that up across all of the journals and all of the papers that are submitted to them, that will in actual fact generate significantly um, higher revenues. Even though at the very top of the chart, there's, you know, yeah, we've, we've seen the very few outliers, but on the whole, the basic width of the chart is the same. We've actually chopped off the very extreme right-hand side of this chart just, just to, to keep things um, easier to view. So that spread and balance of prices and whether you nudge up a, a few journals a little bit and, and watch that multiply up, that is an actual fact, I think, a useful indicator and analysis of how the market's going. And so, although, if you like, the average price has dropped, I suspect, in actual fact, the, the, the average revenue generated is beginning to grow slightly as, as, as prices spread out. Um, and arrow number three is really there just to emphasize that, that as the curves get shallower, that what that means is there's more and more journals at the kind of mid to high end coming in, and therefore, the chances of a given author on a given paper paying a bit more start to go up. And so therefore the total costs in the system go up and the total revenues in the system go up. So we think this is quite a useful way of, of, of looking at how prices spread out. And in one of our previous news and views, we actually dived into this in quite some detail. And you know, you, you can even see that 
um, we, we, we've, we found two publishers that their headline prices basically increased by the same amount, a couple of percent. But when you multiplied it up across the market and did this sort of analysis, one of them seemed to end up with a lot more revenue potential and one of them seemed to end up with a lot less revenue potential, even though they both started at the kind of the, the, the same increase. So I think the area under the chart is actually um, quite important. Uh, and then we're doing the same thing here, except we're now looking at fully open access journals only. So it's the, exactly the same principle. Um, the reason you get a uh, slightly different shape, there's two things going on here. One at the very less left, um, that spike is the completely free. There is no charge offered. Those are typically the sponsored uh, some kind, sometimes known as diamond or platinum open access journals and certainly preferred nomenclature there. Um, so we're just showing there's actually quite a lot of titles where the author is simply not responsible for an APC. You then move to the right of the chart, we see this, this what was a sort of double peak um, in previous years, so the, the green line, and then they seem to come together in, in, a, in a sort of single most common uh, price point, that was the, the yellow one in the middle, and then things have sort of got slightly wobblier and flattened out again. And now we see that there's quite a, a broad spread of common price points for fully open access journals. So it's a slightly more complicated uh, picture for fully open access. Um, and finally, um, some of you might have noticed the small print, the N15,000, um, that's quite a lot less than the 59,000 or so uh, sample size that was on the previous slide. So again, to my point, the shape of the hybrid market tends to set the shape of the overall market just because it has the, the lion's share of journals by number. But as you start to pull apart the data, you, you get different patterns emerge. Um, so these two slides are a little bit complicated. I'm quite they're sort of quite visually complicated, but I hope they give you a sense of how things are changing over time and how there's the notion of looking at the spread of prices across a portfolio, in this case, the market. And then that can give us some sense of where the total value or total costs might lie. Um, and again, um, Anne, I don't know if you want to come, come in on that. Well, actually, rather than add to that, let's get to some of the questions that we have Absolutely. now. So yeah. We're sure to get to them. So um, one of the earlier questions uh, was, d would it be possible to do any analysis of pricing against discipline, quality measures like journal ranking, um, even if that's thought to be dubious, um, citation counts. How does it break down by price and band, I wonder? Yeah, um, so the short answer is yes. Um, forgive me, I'm not going to show the whole internet uh, at our subscription tool, but absolutely, uh, we, that's one of the, 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 uh, the sort of uh, pieces of value we, we really think we, we bring to the table, um, and that we, we do uh, cross-reference this data, and this is where the hard work comes in. A, you've got to go and gather all these prices, and every publisher has a different format, and many publishers will, will, will show you different lists of prices for fully open versus hybrid versus everything else. So we're going to collate all that, and then we cross-reference it um, where we can find titles in an index that have been subject classified. And that does then allow us to dice and slice this and say, OK, um, overall, this is showing us kind of what's cheap and expensive and commonplace. But for subject area X, for discipline, for chemistry, or cheese making, or physics, or whatever you, you want, what's the shape of the chart for that? And you do find very different um, patterns. Um, and then in terms of looking at uh, comparing this by measures of impact. Um, so yes, again, we do that. We, we compare it with subject neutral measures of impact. Um, and that enables us to look at uh, patterns in that data. Um, Anne and I have actually written a paper on this and, and, and there is a, 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 all sorts of charts in the tool that allows us to pull this apart. But the basic headline is there seems to be very little relationship between how much is being asked for a journal and how much impact it has. The single biggest predictor of a journal's price is whether it's fully open access or hybrids, which is why you see the, 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 um, the curves here have, their peaks are in different places. Um, but then it seems that there can be a lot of journals that um, offer the same price, but for, for very different levels of impact. So, so you, you, know, you might argue, therefore, if you're a, an author who wants to shop around for price, you want to go for the one at the same price with the highest measure of impact, because that will give you the best bang for your buck. And so on. Is it um, easy for you to get to that one dot plot? I think that would be helpful. And someone else had the same question about impact factor. Um, the the SNP yeah. dot plot. 
Yeah, we'll have a quick look at that. So this is versus impact. We'll just wait for the uh, the browser to refresh. So here's this is the um, the slide that sends us all dotty. You'll see what the pun means as it draws itself. Um, so this is now uh, what you're going to see is a, is a chart that shows you one dot per journal. Um, here we go. Um, one dot per journal. Blue dots are hybrid. Yellow dots are fully open access. And then what we're doing is we're plotting the journal's APC on the vertical axis. And then our measure of impact is the SNP, the source normalized impact for paper. So that's essentially is calculated in a very similar way to the journal impact factor. So you um, accept it's over a slightly different time period. But then what happens is it's weighted um, to account for differences in citation patterns in different disciplines because some disciplines cite more than others. They just have a longer list of references. So what, what the, uh, the team at CWTS do, they, they, they take a, a, a cut of the Scopus data and then they, they calculate this, is they try and put everything together so it's, it's all on the kind of same scale. And what that means is a scale of a, a SNP of one, that is, means that the journal has the average citations or an average amount of citations for its subject. And by doing it that way, you can therefore compare journals across different subjects, because typically social sciences generate fewer citations, say, than medicine or some of the life sciences. We're collapsing all that, so you can now genuinely compare like for like. And really, what you look at this chart, what you're seeing is um, there's no pattern. If there was a relationship, you'd expect a sort of diagonal line and the dots with at least cluster around a diagonal line. They're much more like a blob. Um, having just sort of spilt a couple of rice on the floor is, is, is more the relationship there. So what that's saying is, is that for a given level of impact, there are a lot of journals right. um, that offer a similar price. Oh. And just to make the point about subject areas, um, we can dice and slice this data by subject and we can then find out, so what might this look like? So for example, if I was to scroll down to, uh, let's just have a look at across the social sciences, um, I always pick social sciences because actually technically what we're doing is considered a social science, as I'm reminded when I go to the British Library uh, or used to go to the British Library. So here we just dice and slice things for social sciences. And you, you can see, um, again, there's, there's not a huge relationship, maybe a slightly well, more Well, except, diagonal. Dan, it's obviously a whole lot more hybrid than, than exactly. old open yeah. access. That's one visual that you can see right away is that, wow, yeah. this is predominantly hybrid. Um, yeah. but, but getting back to the original question, which I think is really interesting, is that there really isn't a clear correlation between um, yeah. source normalized impact per paper and price, which is very funny because yeah. one would think in all things being equal, and I understand they're not, but in all things being equal, you would think that there would be some move towards that, yeah. you know, given it's such a driving force in the market. Um, a couple of things, though. So we did have a question. Sorry, I'm just just before we move on, I, I think because that that does speak back to our uh, you know the earlier question about would people pay these very high APCs, um, you know that like relationship says well they, they may or may not. Um, but I think the interesting thing is um, this gets us into a discussion of what is the market about, and Anne we're you know Anne and I were exploring this um, you know when we we're preparing for today, and if you think about our market. It's actually there's there's two very important groups of people in it. There is the author who is going to choose their journal, and and although many authors will express support for open access in principle, in practice a number of studies have found that their primary thought about selecting a journal is a is it relevant, and that could in turn be dictated to them by their supervisor or, or whatever the journal club says. So a is it relevant, and b how prestigious is it? Is it likely to advance my standing academically? Meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, you've got the people with the checkbooks and they may be different people. It may actually be the funder that is paying the APC or a university library that is paying an APC, even though the author may be responsible for initiating it and, and arranging it. So you've got this kind of disparity. And, and I think that might explain some so, of this lack of relationship. Yeah, and then some of this we don't have to you know, guess at. So one of the things that we've done, and, and please leave this up because I, I have another question about it. But one of the, the things that um, you know, we've done at Delta Think is we've done a whole lot of market research 
with authors, with people that you know are either starting open access journals, with people that are looking at their turnaway data, or you know things that they rejected and they wound up being published someplace else. We've talked to a lot of researchers involved with commercial and society publishing, and um, you know it is true that there's a whole lot of weight that's put on um, their colleagues and their referrals and how things are done in their particular lab or in, in their environment. So there are a lot of other factors that are contributing to how people actually act, what they're willing to pay, and in different environments, they have different levels of funding. So one question I want to go back because um, you know who you are. You've been very patient. You're the, the oldest question on the list here. Um, do the gold APC numbers differentiate between broad scope gold journals like PLOS One and gold journals with a narrower and more traditional scope. And I'm wondering, Dan, if, if there's a way to even, um, yeah, to, to show just, um, you know, mega journals or whatnot. Yeah. If yeah. That so um, short answer is yes. Uh, part of the work we do, um, I'm, I'm just looking, um, here, here we go, multidisciplinary. Um, part of the work we do when, when we take in the, the, the list of subjects is, is we do look at things. I remember when we first, started putting this together, I was quite surprised to find that by far and away, the greatest uptake of open access appeared in, I think, immunology it was. And it turned out, it just so happened, that's how one of the really big mega journals had been categorized. So what we do as part of our subject categories that you can see on screen here, is we, we do call out the multidisciplinary journals. They are the broad brushstroke. They are the um, uh, exactly those sorts of things that the gold journals and the interesting thing here and and we've also got I mean I'll just give you a quick quick glimpse of this we do a lot of statistical analysis so that table of numbers is, is all sorts of all, all sort of deep stats so we can actually look at the correlation coefficients of these things and one of the things we do look for is whether or not it's a broad brushstroke um, disciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary journal. And if you look, especially at the yellow dots on this, you will notice they do sort of start to gravitate around a, a diagonal line. Yes, there's still some outliers. And um, what we're finding is there is indeed more of a relationship, I think, in, in those um, broad coverage journals where you, you do send, tend to see that impact or, or citation count is a much greater predictor of whether or not they're likely to be cheap or expensive. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Thank you for your patience on that one. And I hope we've managed to answer it quite comprehensively. Dan, I'm going to skip around a little bit here. Um, so are journals typically offering a single APC or are they offering bans based on other factors like article type, society membership status, yep. the length of the article? Um, and then I'm going to go on to say, since we do know that they do offer multiple prices in a lot of cases, why don't you explain a little bit about how we deal with that in the data? Yeah, I, I mean, yes, they do. Uh, and all of the above. Uh, my, my sort of standing joke on this is if you can think of a business model in our industry, the chances are somebody is using it. Um, we, we're a very experimental industry, I think, in that sense. So that then poses the problem because if, if people are charging different rates or different discounts, how do we compare across the marketplace? So what we do for the purposes of this analysis is we need to take a constant so we can compare like with like. Uh, partly that constant is in time. We take a snapshot in January every year. So it sort of doesn't matter when people change their prices, it would always fall in the same bucket. Um, and the other thing we do is we look at list APCs before any discounts or waivers or membership fees. And also we are taking APCs for CCBY, so the most permissive license is typically on offer. Um, we know, however, that publishers, for example, many publishers will charge a, uh, a discount if you want a more restricted license. So they'll charge less for, let's say, a CC non-derivative, non-commercial than they would for a CCBY, which, which is very permissive. I would um, say, though, Dan, we have seen that decreasing in, um, it used to be very prevalent to charge different yeah. prices for CCBY versus um, more restrictive licenses. And yeah. I think we're seeing less of that, although I don't have the exact numbers on that. That's more of a no, sense. I, I, I think it, it's crazy, but it, you know, it, it, I mean, it's an important point because if, if we sort of took the, the discounted price for some publishers and they're not discounted for others, then clearly these sorts of analyses um, you know, would probably be misleading. Um, so I think the short answer to the question is yes, there is a big variety based on permissiveness um, 
the type of article, so quite often a short form article or a conference paper or things like that will be charged less than, you know, the kind of quote full fat peer reviewed paper. Review articles may be more expensive. Uh, um, as I said, pretty, pretty well, anything, any variation you can think of, the chances of um, a publisher or two may be experimenting with it. Um, and, yeah. you know, they'll be setting things up really based on what they feel works for their particular organization and their particular business. And to make another distinction, though, um, and this also addresses, I think, another question that's on the, the Q&A list here. Um, so two things. So one is you're talking about list prices and that using list prices allows us to compare apples and apples and to make some comparisons about the market. So first point that I'd like to make there is that's actually the best way to do this because what you're looking for are trends. So you're yeah. not saying, well, this has gone from $594.32 to $872. You just want to understand that there's been this magnitude shift. And by doing that, by normalizing it, it allows us to make more assumptions and you know more statements and, and analyze the market better. The second thing though, and this gets to the other question that's on um, uh, the, the Q&A here about um, APC prices versus actual price paid, um, is that what we do is we do have a very uh, private proprietary, we do not share um, survey with all of the major publishers um, regarding discounts and things of that nature. So when you look at our market sizing sections in, in the tool, and when we present that in October, when we talk about market sizing, we're not saying, oh, we're taking number of vo you know, volume times, you know, APC and coming up with market sizing. It is much more involved in that. And models are created and they're adjusted based on the prevalence of different discounts and the behaviors that we learn about from those surveys. So the market sizing is honed based on that, but we would never ever, we do not release any of that information publisher by publisher, and we don't um, store that in the tool in any way. I don't know, Dan, if you wanna add anything, the question was, do you break out list price of APC versus the actual including discounts yeah. and waivers? Um... I, I think, I, I mean, yes, all of the above. Um, I, we, we've got, there, are, there is some data out there. There's uh, uh, Max Planck Digital Library run a, a few projects, one of which is the Open APC project. And that's taking, that's a, that, is a, that is public information. And that, uh, the, the backbone of that you know, are researchers submitting information about their actual payments to the project and they collate a central database. I think they've got about 100, 120 or thousand articles in there. Um, so they can have a look at what's actually being paid and break that out by fully open access and hybrid. We have done analysis where we've taken that data in and we've tried to relate what people are saying they are paying for a given journal against what the journal's list price is. And I remember I was so excited to run that first time around. I thought, oh, there'll be a nice relationship. No, it's just another blog. Um, so, uh, and, and speaking to the people um, who... who um, running the open APC project or, or know about it you know they said there could be any variety of reasons for that not least of which the people filling in the form you know may have included some of them may have included sales tax VAT others may have not you know there could be a basic misunderstanding in collating the data um, and then of course different institutions will receive different discounts and so forth so I think as Anne said it's, it's actually it's a very amorphous blob of data and what we're trying to do is find the things that we can get to the trends on because quite often what, what people want to know is, OK, if I'm thinking about uh, founding an open access journal or flipping my journals to open access, what's cheap and what's expensive and how where do I want to sit in that spectrum? And those are the sorts of questions that really do lend themselves to, to trends analysis. Because you say, OK, well, let's have a look at your subject area, if you're into social sciences, or cheese making, whatever. You know, we can look at what's going on there on a life for life basis. Um, and then, you know, you can model the kind of discounts you want to add to those list prices as, as suits you. But at least you can get a, a sort of like for like context in which you can set what you're doing. And, and that's where I think a lot of the analysis on this um, can prove quite valuable. So, Dan, just to also add on to that, too, what's really interesting about some of the analyses that we've gotten to do that um, are not um, 
uh, that, that are not necessarily, that, that aren't in the tool is that oftentimes, sometimes with subscribers, sometimes with folks that don't subscribe, we'll actually go through, here's our data around their partic particular specialties and subspecialties, and then we get their actual data from their organization. And it does help give a picture of kind of where you sit in, in the, um, you know, in, in the market, so to speak. Um, one of the things we have a few more questions. I'm just sensitive. We have about 19 minutes left. Um, so one actually we just answered. So I'm just going to recap this again about do we collect any data on APC waivers? And we do, but in aggregate. So not yeah. individually. Um, we don't you know, individually collect that as related to different journals or whatnot. But in aggregate, we do get publisher information about waivers and we do apply that to market sizing, which is not what we're talking about today, but um, another part of, of what- And sorry, to that open APC data that I mentioned, I was hoping that might give us some data on waivers, but it just didn't. You know, We were finding sometimes the price declared was higher than the list price. I suspect that's an error in the data and not really what's going on. So it, um, so do, no, we, so, and, you know, and, and that's a good point, though, just we're, we are always I mean, not to go on about the tool, that's not the purpose of this, but we are always looking for additional data sources and trying to figure out, you know, how to weave them in and crosswalk them, to, you know, into a, a singular analysis. Um, so, yeah, so Dan's always got his his uh, his eyes out. So um, two more questions that I see here. One is um, really an opinion uh, that we can kind of both comment, uh, will the very high priced articles like Nature be much more cited when they are fully OA compared to when they were still behind the paywall? I assume you can only see that in the next few years, but I think that will be the expectation from the publisher or author. So what is your take on that, Dan? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, and I think the answer's changed. So if you'd asked that question, I think a few years ago, the general view was there is no evidence supporting a citation advantage of uh, open access journals uh, from many quarters. Uh, and then other quarters would equally vigorously say, no, there's, there's every evidence there is. But I think in the last, particularly the last couple of years, there has been some studies that suggest that if, if you put something outside of paywall, yes, you are likely to gain um, more citations I caveat that heavily. I'm sure that there's all sorts of things in there, but I think in general, it's less controversial now since there might be a, a citation advantage. Um, now, as to how that then plays into the expectation of author and or publisher, of course, we're speculating here. Um, I, I think that the thing that's driving that is more likely to be, in my view, the funders' policies, things like Plan S, a, a general view across the market of engaging with open access engaging with these so-called transformative deals, which, which look to move journals from being hybrids to, to fully open. It's just in the, the nature of journals will do that. Um, and I, I would speculate that's more likely to be the, the, the sort of driving force there, especially for the publishers who are just, would say, look, we, we're trying to keep up with the market, the market's changing. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's actually expecting a spectacular citation advantage. And I'd imagine getting published in, in nature or other yeah, high-impact yeah. journals are available, science, so and so forth. I'd imagine getting published in any of those would bring with it an expectation of, of um, glory and publicity and all that sort of thing, because they're, they're very um, prominent journals. Um, and so, anyway, my, my point that um, I wanted to make was that these are unique. Like, I really like this question because um, while on general, on average, and we always talk about the average not necessarily being an indication of an individual case, that um, that we are, you know, we're starting to see some agreement around us there being a citation advantage. When you're talking about, I mean, the whole reason that these high, highly, the, these high impact journals are high impact is because they already have a huge citation differential, at least as measured by the imperfect measurement of the impact factor. But so I think it's a very interesting idea to think, would that increase even more? And I'm almost wondering, my, my guess is I actually don't know that I would expect that it would because um, it's already so yeah. skewed. It would be ironic, I think, you know, thinking about this question, it would be really ironic if making open, if, if making things in nature or cell open actually increased their impact factor, it would almost, it, it would kind of almost be yeah. humorous. Um, 
<laughs> there's also another subtlety which is um, our industry is all about the long tail. So in other words, when, when it, I've noticed that whenever you do a data plot, there'll be a, like a really big spike at one end of the chart and then you know really thin long tail. And I believe it's exactly the same if you look at which papers in a journal are highly cited. They don't, they're not all cited the same. You will get a few papers that are very highly cited and a long tail of papers that are not nearly as highly cited because that's aggregated together to form that journal's impact factor or SNP or, or whatever measure of impact it is. But of course, just, just because a journal follows a pattern, exactly as Anne said, the average doesn't necessarily tell you what the outliers look like. So you know, who knows, a, a paper that happens to be open and therefore maybe attracts even more than the usual high volume of citations, maybe it maybe could have a, 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 a you know, lifting effect on that journal's overall average. Um, I think exactly as the question I said, it will be, you know, we've got to wait two or three years before we will really be able to tell. Um, and of course, we don't yet know what the uptake of that, that is back to our really early question list, you know. We don't know yet if someone's actually written a check for the $11,390. Um, I think only time will tell. So let's move on. We have a couple more questions. Um, are you seeing any correlation between the geographic focus of a journal and APC? So specifically, for example, are China having lower APCs than US or other parts of the world? Um, the thing that Sean says is less than you might think. So certainly in some territories, I think India in particular, uh, the, the, the average APCs tend to be much lower. And it's also worth noting that uh, in the same way that for subscriptions, publishers will often waive their fees or greatly to reduce their fees when selling into very low income countries, exactly the same rules usually apply for article processing charges and quite often using exactly the same benchmarks. So, um, you know, research for life in ARI, that sort of thing, uh, you know, I, I believe will span both or publishers might say, look, we look at the OECD or the World Bank indexes and if a country is in, in, in the, you know, the, the poorer section, that's it, we don't, we don't charge them for anything. So in that sense, they'll probably more likely to be a complete APC waivers or very significant redu reductions from, based on that geographic focus. I think China's interesting. I'm not sure if there's necessarily the kind of levels of discount in China that take place. I don't know, Anne, if you have picked up on that. No, I have not. Um, I really, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I've never, you know, it would be interesting to break out the data and look at different geographic regions, even more specifically by discipline too. I wonder if that would have any impact. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I know that's not necessarily analysis that yeah. we've done. Uh, I so mean, I mean yeah. maybe another aspect of that question is really what's the, the territory's funders and government's view right. on open access. So, you know, for example, we know that Europe and the UK are pushing ahead with, with variations of open access. We're all on tenterhooks to see what the US uh, OSTP uh, is going to come out with. Will they move away from their so-called public access policy and go to a more robust open access policy? Genuinely don't know on that one. And then conversely, China, which I think a couple of years ago at a conference sort of signaled its support for open access, of course, it's, it's actually got a different set of priorities now, and it's, it's really trying to increase the amount of Chinese journals that its authors submit and publish to. Um, and I think there can be a little bit of a negative view towards open access journals in China. They're, they're quite often seen as somehow being of lower quality. I think that perception changing, but I suggest that it's a perception like that might then affect whether or not somebody right. submits to an open access journal at all, completely orthogonal to, no. to what they're prepared to pay um, if, if they get accepted or not. I do think though that um, one thing that changes the perception that I've seen a few times now is publisher having boots on the ground in China. So, I mean, I think that as far as um, the perception of something being questionable somehow diminishes when people are physically present um, from the, the publisher. Uh, I want to go back to the most patient person in the audience um, who has had a question for a while that was in the chat that I just saw. Um, do you have a sense across publishers of cost pricing versus market pricing? Um, and yeah. what I would say is we've actually done a lot of analysis. We've worked with a lot of publishers around this. And usually what we see is a combination of both. So everybody's looking at what the market will bear but then they're also looking at their own costs and trying to understand if their cost structure 
fits into what the market will bear. And in cases where their cost structure is higher than the, what the market would bear, they'll try to inch up while they try to do things if they can to lower their structure. And again, I'm not talking about the highest tier journals here as far as impact factor goes, um, but I'm talking about you know more, the journals, you know more of their your you know high quality good journals that um, have you know reasonable maybe top ten impact factors in their field or even less than that. Um, but in cases where the market seems to be able to bear um, more than their cost structure you do see them inching up towards the market. So where they can do that, they, they tend to do that. So, um, so the answer is kind of a little bit of both, but one would argue that it's the market pricing for everyone that doesn't have, um, you know, so I was going to say that doesn't necessarily have the brand that can carry these higher prices, but I wanna be fair. Um, all the journals that we work with, quite frankly, come from organizations with amazing brands, good brands, solid, you know, good, high quality journals. But when, um, but there is a difference between these marquee brands that can come out like Cell and Nature did, and we'll see if it's successful or not. But there's no indication at this point to think it's going to be, you know, a disaster in any way. But they can come out and change the market's perception with these higher prices. The average journal can't do that. So they really are looking to get in line with their competitors as much as they possibly can. I don't know, Dan, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. You know, you, you tend to get the, these outliers and then the, um, the big clump in the, in the center as, as our visuals have, have shown us. Um, I think on the whole, you know, I've heard it said that, that our market is very much a supply side one. So I think that therefore it is, tends to be more value pricing than cost pricing. I'm sure one of the hopes by some of the advocates of open access was that they would introduce some more sort of competitive landscape in, into things. But, but as we explored earlier, because there's such a, a, a low, in fact, non-existent relationship between what's being charged and perceptions of quote quality, unquote, please note the quotes or the usual caveat supply, um, then, you know, it, it might be argued, well, of course, in that, in that, sort of market the suppliers will charge what they think the market will bear and continue to be a sort of value uh, driven policy um and you know if, if people pay it they'll pay it and if they don't they, they don't like that they'll start to negotiate and, and, and pay less um but i, I don't think I, I think to be honest with you um at the moment open access prices if you compare the total value of the market the total um numbers of uh, articles published in it on average the APC of uh, or the pricing that's charged for open access articles is less than the overall average per article realized in the market. That to me suggests that prices will go up unless some major change happens and people really do start shopping around. Um, but uh, but I, I suspect so that let's, more let's more... the last couple of questions here, Dan. Sorry, before we run out of time. No, 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 at all. Um, uh, so w one that I would actually like to put out to this group, we have a bunch of people on the line and they may be... Um, even more fully informed than we are about this, is um, is there an indication that OSTP is likely to change policy? So I will I will take that one. So from what I've heard so far, um, th this definitely is paused. I mean, the administration changes is one thing. We have to see how this administration will regard what was being considered as 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 um, policy. Uh, again, a lot of the meetings that happened with OSTP happened before last March. They were happening in January and February. So obviously the nation and the world have been focused in, in other places. So um, if there's anybody on the line, if you wanna type in the chat, if you know anything about the progress of OSTP, it would be really great to hear it. Um, we don't have any inside or special information that any of you would not have. Um, and then finally, we have a few more minutes here, looking at the last question, does Delta Think do similar studies as you displayed for APCs for BPCs, um, for book processing charges, since the OA book market seems to be on the move and similar issues exist? Um, and so the short answer to that is from a custom perspective we have within the tool um, to date, we, we um, had a book section a while back, but we've not focused on that. So I do think that that is uh, an interesting thing for us to start looking at again, 
you know, dependent upon various data, various data sources that are accessible. But the short answer is in the tool, no, on a custom basis, um, absolutely. Dan, do you want to add anything to that? No, it's absolutely right. So, absolutely right. I sound like a marquee here. Then, yes, I, it's absolutely. I don't want to add anything to that. <laughs> So, so um, I think Lori is going to join us again, and we have a few more minutes here, but uh, I think we will let, just thank you all for your attendance and I will yeah. hand it over to Lori. Um, yeah, so that's a wrap for today's session. Many thanks uh, to Anne and Dan and to the great questions, really very engaged audience and uh, we appreciate your input. That's what these sessions are all about. So. Uh, we're, we're glad uh, to see that level of participation. Um, we'll be sharing a recording of the session uh, on our website in a few days or so, and you'll receive notification when that's available in case you wanna watch anything again or you wanna share it with a colleague. Um, if anything more occurs to you that you'd like to discuss or something you're interested in um, that you wanna talk about further, please feel free to email us. Uh, Dan and Anne's emails should be up on the screen right now. So, uh, so any comments, questions, welcome. And uh, watch for word of our next discussion forum, probably in the uh, next two months or so, there'll be another um, news and views discussion forum and we'd love to see you all back again. And well, uh, the sad so thing too, is that if you wanna see uh, this or any of the previous um, discussions we've had on different topics, they're all on the YouTube. Are you yes. Yes, that's true as well. Yeah, there's a YouTube channel and all of the previous discussions are on there. And I believe they're linked from our website blog as well, um, if you wanna find them through there. So thank you all again. Great chatting with you and um, have a great weekend. Bye everybody, thanks. Bye. Bye.